Hey there, Wealthy Nation. How are you doing? I hope you are doing good. Doing pretty well myself. Had a nice long weekend since we've been here, but we're back, keeping these videos rolling, trying to put our finger on neoliberalism and figure out just what we can do about it. So let's break down, I think, something that is missing from the conversation so far. We've talked about neoliberalism from an abstract sense. Um, what is it from a sort of a theoretical perspective? Where does it come from? What are its uh, main tenets? But how does it actually affect us in our regular lives? This is important to understand, too, to really sort of um, make it click. If it, if it hasn't yet, and even if you if it sort of makes sense, but it's difficult because neoliberalism seems to be a term that applies to everything and nothing. It really depends on kind of how you look at it. So hopefully this clears things up, how neoliberalism affects our actual daily lives. Let's step through some real examples. Why wait? Let's get right to it, Wealthy Nation. So our first three, which we've talked about uh, in an, again, theoretical sense. Uh, neoliberalism promotes profit over people, so economics are at the center of all decision-making. It dehumanizes humans. People are redefined as homo, homo economicus, and it humanizes corporations at the same time. So while humans are dehumanized, corporations are given human rights. And what each of these means, let's go through one at a time. Starting with the first point here, profit over people. This is an underlying belief of neoliberal uh, policies, ideas, structures, organizations, and so on. Most evident in the work of Milton Friedman in his uh, Friedman's Doctrine, which was published in the New York Times in 1970. Uh, I mentioned him a lot. He's definitely not the only founding father of neoliberalism, so to speak. He is one of many, uh, but he is a he is a big one. He is he is. Uh, Definitely not alone, but he is a lot. He is uh, he's a lot of at least in this country. So we talk about the Friedman Doctrine for being profit over people for bringing about that idea that business's only social responsibility is to increase its profits. That's the full title of his work. So right there in the title, businesses are all about profits. No other social responsibility but money. So profit over people. The second point here, dehumanizing humans, and this term homo economicus, that term actually existed before neoliberalism. That, that comes from an older school of economic thought, which uh, has humans as purely rational, utility-maximizing consumers. So the original idea of homo economicus was actually uh, dispelled by the work of um, Daniel Kahneman and Amos Tversky, very same researchers that we talk about in our hegemony, the psychology of hegemony series, uh, they came up with behavioral psychology which disproved this whole psychological model of the rational human. People thought that humans were purely rational, we make all of our decisions based on facts and it's uh, uh, the, our choice's utility to us once we, once we made that choice. So behavioral psychology did away with that old version of uh, sort of the utility maximization homo economicus. But neoliberalism brings this idea back. And it's, and it's a bit different now. It's not that we're purely rational, because they understand humans are irrational, we're very emotional, not purely logical. We feel as much as we think. So the new neoliberal definition is not quite uh, what the original word means, but it's more that homo economicus defines people as if our, our, our existence is to consume. Our reason for existence is to consume. Our purpose is to purchase. That's what we're here to do. We're here to buy things. We're here to make money and then use that money to buy things. And the last bit here, humanizing corporations. So as we're reduced to uh, sort of uh, economic cogs in the giant machine, corporations are granted human rights, like the ability to sue in court and sponsor politicians, which is kind of an interesting flip about what who freedom applies to. Who does freedom apply to in the neoliberal world? Is it us or is it corporations? Our next bit here. <laughs> Uh, what a cliffhanger. 
and we're going to get to that about who is free, freedom pertains to in a neoliberal world, because unfortunately it's not us. Freedom is freedom of markets, not freedom of humans. So just to address that cliffhanger, let's go ahead and move on here. An example of profit over people, because that's what we're here to do, is give real specific examples of how neoliberalism affects our lives. Artificial scarcity. For those who don't know what this is, when farmers overproduce a crop, uh, they are contractually obligated, uh, sometimes legally obligated, to destroy the excess food so that the market prices remain consistent. If there's too much that they produce, then the prices are going to crash because they got to sell it all. So they're actually paid to destroy excess food. Instead of giving it to feed the hungry, instead of using that excess food for those who actually need it, we destroy it and we do separate things for philanthropy for the homeless and hungry in our country. It's weird, but that is market logic. Market logic says we need to regulate the prices, so we'll destroy the excess food if that's what it takes. And it shifts all the costs, all the burden to the farmers. They're already pl planting and growing and harvesting as much as they can because yields are so thin, margins are so thin as it is. So when they overproduce, it's something that we as a society should celebrate and we should use that excess food, but instead we're forced to destroy it so that the markets can continue to work their magic. So there's one, artificial scarcity. Uh, in terms of dehumanizing humans, if you think about what it means to be productive today, that word productivity means how much are you working, how much are you making, and how much are you spending, both at the national level and at the personal level. National level, we have GDP, and at the personal level, it's are you being productive? Have you worked today? Have you done something? Have you built something? Have you made some money? Our idea of productivity is now centered around how much we earn and how much we consume. That's neoliberalism. Third, with our humanizing corporations here, there's the political funding. So we mentioned that corporations have a right to fund politicians. Kind of strange when you think about it, when you think about what a government is meant to be, that we allow these corporations to fund not just candidates, but legislation. They lobby for the laws. These days, they pretty much write the laws. There have been a, a handful of cases where the actual lobby group, the letterhead that they used to send it to their local politician, wasn't even taken off the document when the politician presented it to Congress. It's just copy-paste from what the lobbyists say. So political funding is interesting. And again, a government is supposed to be in charge of the people. It's supposed to be how we people organize. It's interesting that we've given that right to corporations. So we'll press on a few more examples of profit over people as planned obsolescence. Now, we've all experienced this with our smartphones. It is good business for companies to sabotage their own products into an early death so that we have to buy the new upgrade. Pretty self-explanatory. You make more money when people buy the new version of your product. There's nothing legally obligating you to make a product work forever. So why don't you make the product break down a little bit? People will replace it. It's not just phones. Phones are an easy example because they can do it via software, so they can almost do it on command. Um, it's also things like uh, washing machines are a good example. Washing machines are just made from components now that break down easier. And I've had a washing machine break down several times, and the repairman will say to me, yeah, that old washing machines work forever. New ones, they figured out, they don't need to make it work forever. They need you to buy a new one. If your washing machine works forever, you're not going to buy a new one. So planned obsolescence, that's a major one. And we see that every day, all around us. Uh, another aspect of how we are dehumanized, we people are dehumanized, is that our personal identity, both our productivity and our identity, come from our career. Our main measure of success is what we do for a living. It's how much respect I'm going to give you. It's what's your job. And that is... Another thing that people might say predates neoliberalism, but it's, it's, it's something that has gone off the rails with neoliberalism. 
everything is about what you do for a living, and now also, what are your side hustles? What are you doing on the side? Because making a living is not enough anymore. You need to sacrifice your free time in order to really get ahead. So our personal identity becomes our productivity, which is our measure of consuming and producing, which is a weird cycle there that spirals pretty quickly. And the third bit here, building off of the previous point for the um, corporation's ability to fund political candidates, is uh, another cycle here, political profiteering. <laughs> when there's, when there's, <laughs> when, when a business only has one social responsibility per neoliberalism, which is to maximize its profit, there's only one criteria for choosing a candidate. Who's going to help me maximize my profits? It has nothing to do with what's this candidate going to do for the community or the people or the environment. It's only about how that politician is going to help you increase your profit. So those are three gener general examples, generic examples. Where was I going with that word? Who knows? Um, three general examples, uh, each with two sort of specific examples there. Let's press on a little bit because there's more to be said. Some more consequences of neoliberalism are this number four piece right here, free market exploitation. Executives who are well-educated, this is not malevolent or dumb, or these aren't bad guys, these are highly educated executives, are fully able to take advantage of this amoral market landscape. The market doesn't have any morals, so as long as you're making money, you're doing good business. Number five, the illusion of choice. Mega corporations who are uninhibited by these pesky taxes are free to acquire their competitors and consolidate entire industries into single companies. So we're living in an age of monoliths right now, of monopolies and oligarchies um, in big tech and big pharma uh, and consumer packaged goods space all over, all over. So we have an illusion of choice that goes along with that. These brands are smart. When they acquire all the smaller companies, they don't just give us one homogenous, you know, brown paper bag of stuff. They, they give us our brands. They give us the illusion of choice. But when you're choosing between M&Ms and Skittles in that advertisement war, Mars is the one who wins no matter what. It's an illusion of choice. So that's number five. Number six is just a general lower quality of life. There are these big examples of how neoliberalism affects us, but really it chips away at our quality of life, and everything starts to suffer bit by bit as all of these industries sacrifice quality of their product and services for profits. So let's look at some examples of these. For the free market exploitation, an obvious example is the pharmaceutical space, specifically the uh, Pharma Bro, uh, Pharma Bro Martin Shkreli, who we talk about in a different video. And what's important to note about uh, Martin is that he was not alone. He drew a lot of attention to himself for doing it brazenly. He was very unapologetic, almost bragged about the fact that what he was doing was totally legal. He was just a smart businessman doing business. So he drew a lot of media attention to, um, I'll explain what he did, it's important to know. He uh, created a company and bought the rights to sell a drug, which was um, a, a drug for um, a type of parasitic infection. And so this is a life-saving drug and he increased the price of a pill by 5,000% overnight. And, and it's per pill might not seem like a lot, but there were patients who were using this medicine that now had to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars a year just to stay alive. So just to stay alive, your life or death dependency on this medication is reduced to an inelastic demand. And that's what neoliberal markets think of us as humans. There is no morality in helping people survive. 
When somebody needs something, that's an inelastic demand, and you're a good business person for taking advantage of that, for exploiting that. We call it capitalizing on the opportunity. Capitalizing. Get that capital, baby. So there's one example. The free market opens the door wide for people to legally come in and do this. This is this is completely legal, but in my view, it's it's beyond manipulative. It is it's unethical, it's evil, it's dangerous to our society to have this practice because it's not just Martin. The drug that, that Martin's company sold is called Daraprim. There was another drug called Cycloserine, which was for uh, a tuberculosis. Uh, drug. This one had a 2,000% increase, and after the backlash from Martin Shkreli, uh, the company that had increased the price of this new drug rolled theirs back a little bit. They were doing the same thing, too. It's good business, but they recognized that the popular opinion um, was against them, and so they rolled that back. All, this information comes from a New York Times article, which I'll link in the notes. And uh, in that article, there are three other drugs who, whose price were increased on the range between 200% and 500%, which means they doubled in cost or they quintupled in cost. Uh, and then there was another drug called doxycycline, which is an antibiotic, which increased from $20 a bottle to $1,849 a bottle, a 9,000% increase. So this is happening all over the industry because it's an opportunity. These are inelastic demands on these goods. And so a smart businessman sees that and makes money off of it. That's neoliberalism. Number five. <sighs> Had to take a sip. Number five. The consolidation of U.S. media companies. Forty years ago, there were 50 companies who controlled the U.S. media, about 90% of it. Today, five companies control the U.S. media landscape. Five companies, five executives have control over everything that we see. And the, the source for this article, uh, which again, I'll, I'll provide in the, in the notes, uh, talks about six there are six media companies in the United States. Since then, CBS and Viacom have re-merged, and so we're down to five. So the media consolidation is insane and not stopping anytime soon in this country. Why is that bad? It gives us the illusion of choice. We think we're getting our news from all these different sources when really it could just be the same person telling us in different ways illusion of choice from the consolidation of these industries. Number six for a lower quality of life is just your general experience with healthcare. This one doesn't even come from a source. This is my own personal experience. When you choose a healthcare plan, you have to know everything about co-pays and deductibles and out-of-pocket max. You compare all these different plans. You want to know between an HMO and a PPO. You have to know between your specialist and your PCP. You have to have a dental plan and a vision plan and a hearing plan, which are all different. So healthcare is out of control. It's absolutely out of control. And it's a consequence of the increasing complexity of neoliberalism, which justifies itself. It says it's so complex, the only way to <laughs> sort it out is more complexity. We need to add this thing on top to give us visibility. And this thing on top just adds a layer of reporting, and so now there's even more complexity, and there's even less visibility like we hoped. But we just got to let the market do its thing. It will work itself out. So healthcare has gone completely off the rails. And it's not just when you're choosing your plan. It's actually trying to book an appointment. It's trying to do these things. It's trying to go, and you, you show up at the doctor's office. You wait in the waiting room for 30 minutes. You see the doctor for 10 minutes. You pay him for those 10 minutes. Then you drive over to the pharmacy, and you've got to pay them for the medicine. The doctor didn't give you the medicine. The pharmacy gives you the medicine. So you're going all over this place. The experience is absolute madness. Why do we do this? Why do we do this to ourselves? So to press on, just in the final 
bit here. Don't want to get too long-winded. Final few examples for the free market exploitation is the Wells Fargo account fraud. This one's a little bit more recent. Uh, essentially, between the years of 2002 and 2016, millions of fraudulent accounts were created um, by Wells Fargo employees because they had to meet these impossible sales goals. That's a 14-year period where this is happening. And nobody questioned it enough to expose it until this, uh, until a regulatory agency peeked in and saw what was happening. So th this is a unique example because it's fraud. This is illegal. Uh, what I wanted to highlight really are the legal examples, what's allowed by neoliberalism uh, to um, take advantage of that free market. This is an illegal one. They got away with it for a while, but they had to pay a $3 billion settlement. Not great. An example of a legal version of the free market exploitation would be the mortgage crisis of 2008. You know, I'm not a finance person. My background is not finance. So it's more difficult for me to explain those uh, legal exploitations from a finance perspective because it is messy. You have loans and you have securitizations and you have all of these things. Um, so rather than try to explain that, I went with this Wells Fargo account fraud example because it's nice and recent, and it's still motivated by these neoliberal ideas. We have these impossible sales growth because we need to grow. We're Wells Fargo. We're number, I don't know, four or five or six of the world's banks. We've got to get big. We've got to be in the top three. We've got to do something. So neoliberalism encouraged this idea that they need to grow. They need to set these impossible sales goals, and so they need to do fraud to get there. They need to ha create all these fraudulent accounts to get themselves there. So neoliberalism is the motivation here. Even though that's illegal, there are plenty of legal ways to exploit the free market. And even when it happens illegally, it's clear to see it. And it's a neoliberal motivation. Moving on to number five, our USCPG consolidation stands for consumer packaged goods. Those companies are also consolidating like crazy. Right now, there are about 11 companies who own well over a thousand brands, well over a thousand brands of consumer packaged goods, which is everything from our food to our clothes to our toys to our tobacco, everything, everything. So anything you go buy at the store in a package is a consumer packaged good, uh, and and it's and it's really crazy to see how fast those are um, consolidating as well. I mentioned the uh, the Mars example when you're doing a Skittles versus M&M war. Mars is the, is the big winner there. If you're doing a left Twix, right Twix war, come on, come on. So maybe the last real rivalry here is Coke versus Pepsi. Those are two actual uh, <laughs> companies that are at, at odds, and they do not like each other. Let me tell you. Yeah, from personal experience being in a Coke distribution warehouse, you do not want to make a joke about having a Pepsi vending machine there or anything like that. They won't think it's funny. But in any case, back on track. Our last number here, healthcare expense. Again, similar to the healthcare experience, which is crazy. This one is worth it's worth focusing in on healthcare as an example uh, because of the fact that it's one of the most obvious uh, industries where we would benefit from a central planning body. We would benefit from some sort of government that is helping us stay healthy rather than dozens of private insurance companies competing for our patronage. So in any case, the, the thing that I want to talk about here with healthcare expenses, I watch I watch this advertisement for uh, for medicine, which is which is one thing. Drug companies advertise direct to consumer now because they used to advertise to doctors, and then they essentially had doctors on their payroll to prescribe you the medicine, which was bad. So we said, medicine companies can't do that. You have to advertise direct to consumer, and that's why they say, talk to your doctor about this, because they want you to ask the doctor since they can't do it anymore. So. First of all, there's a little side tangent about why we're marketed to with these drugs. But I was watching one of these drug commercials, probably for anxiety, probably for depression, all of these things. And they go through um, the list of side effects of which death is one. So uh, interesting. Medicaid at risk of 
uh, death. In any case, that, that stuff aside, what I really wanted to talk about for this last piece is at the end of the advertisement, they have a new partner that helps you finance the payments for this medicine. So if this medicine is too expensive, we're not asking ourselves, how should we make it cheaper? We're asking ourselves, how can we finance it for the, consum for the consumer so they can pay monthly installments instead of all at once? We don't have a human right for free or even affordable health care. We're not free to avoid bankruptcy from our illness. You get sick, you go to the hospital, you take an ambulance ride, you have to buy your 5,000% increased medicine. We're not free to avoid any of that. We don't have any sort of right to affordable health care. It wasn't in our Bill of Rights. So it is the right of the market. The market is free to set any price it can, any price it pleases. So that is... A sh a still a short version of how neoliberalism affects our lives today because there are so many examples. There are so many examples of how neoliberalism impacts us uh, on the day-to-day -day level. Hopefully that helps sort of connect some dots. Once you start to read the news, you will really see this everywhere. It is in all of our decision-making across the board, so it's almost hard to just choose a few examples. I encourage you to go out let me know what you find if there is something that you would like me to talk about. I'm happy to because I'm just one person reading my news, drinking my brews, trying to make sense of it all. So if you got something for me to take a look at, I'm happy to. Until then, take care.